Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. My name is Jeremy Gilbertson, builder and futurist, although that definition may change after today. Uh, working at the intersection of music, tech, and story, we got Mark Fielding across the pond. We've managed to pull him off the slopes and uh, the foraging for mushroom missions. Mark, so glad you took time to stay inside with us for a little bit and uh, hang out. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Although it's not just been playing. I have been working this week as well. I've been writing. That's what I do. I'm a writer. I've been sure you have. Um, actually writing about gamif gamification in personalized virtual worlds for influencers and brands. But um, the, the, my most interesting thing I've been doing this week is researching a piece on... Well, I'll start with the question, Jeremy. Uh -oh. Would you like to live forever? That's a real, wow. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Uh, and it depends on the definition of life and how that evolves, right? How am I living? What am I able to do? Am I able to uh, still play lacrosse or am I like in a jar with electrodes <laughs> connected to me, being able to beam my consciousness from here to Mars? Like, that's a deep question, man. I don't but, know. Yeah. Ever, yeah. yeah. Even vampires get bored, don't they? Like Dracula, he was like 800 years old, bored out of his mind. I ask because I've been researching a piece on, on longevity, um, biotech, biohacking, a lot of um, lifestyle changes, but also medicines, rapamycin, aspirin, some others who I can't name because the names are too long. But it's been really fascinating because A, I wouldn't like to live forever, but I would like to have a long health healthy life um, and i think that technology is can and will be able to to change that or to help make that a reality but what was interesting and in trying to tie that to today's guest is while i was researching longevity there was this big variation between what's available now and what you can do now to increase your lifespan and your your health and what will be available in the far future. So it's this kind of like near future, far future variation, what you can do and um, how to optimize those near, nearly available tech solutions and those distant ones, which is kind of reminding me of our guest today because there's a big difference between near future and far future technology. And, uh, and Neil's going to speak about that. It's How's a, that? Yeah, uh, that's wow. That's a great, great way to <laughs> great resonant frequency to kick this kick this whole thing off. I think interesting because we all love to look far out, especially yeah. you and I. Like, and in, in our audience as well, they're very interested in emerging tech and what's happening, what the future holds. But like, it's it's really interesting that, that our guest today uh, is uh, is in this world of near futurism. Near futurist is is his title, and it's to me like exactly like you said. What can we do today? What is achievable and actionable and you know what can we pilot and get better information and keep iterating because i think that's what brands want to know i think that's what people want to know i think that's what businesses want to know yeah um so yeah speaking of businesses we'd like to give a quick shout out to our friends at ripple w-r-i-p-p-l-e marketing's on-demand talent platform these guys have a wonderful um group of about three thousand plus vetted talented people to help you uh, augment your team as you close out the year with that big project. Uh, P.S. Mark and I are on the roster. So uh, check them out, WRIPPLE.com. Usually one of our great representatives from uh, Ripple are in the chat kind of hanging with us too. So thank you guys for that. Without further ado, um, we would like to welcome our guests. So I met, I met Neil um, I think digitally, like I've met a lot of folks digitally, um, I had written something about DAOs that had referenced mycelium network, you know, and basically the underpinnings of the forest floor that, you know, nature communicates on. And that was our moment of connection because he writes about that. He references that in his strategies, in his technologies, but he works with companies to help figure out what the future of experiences look like in a very tangible way. Um, he's worked with a lot of big brands and we are so excited for him to be here to help understand what near futurism is. So uh, Neil, welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? Thank you so much, guys. It's great to be with you. Great to be with everyone who's listening. I am doing great today. I just noticed looking out my window in, uh, in Brooklyn that there's some snow flurries for the first time this season. So it's sort nice. of beginning to feel a lot like the holidays. We'll when, snow in New York must be quite amazing. You know, 
it's pretty for a few minutes. If anyone has just experienced snow in New York, it's like about an hour or two later, or at least after it, after it stops snowing heavily, it gets really nasty. It's like black sludge, you know, that you're, you're just tromping through, but you know, flurries are pretty. It looks like it's not really going to be more Is than it? an hour of flurries right now. So, yeah. But you're, you're used to it. Is it like in, in England, if it snows literally like this much in England, the whole country grinds to a complete halt? No, yeah, that's, Atlanta, that's, that's Atlanta, Georgia. That's, <laughs> you remember snow? No, I know. I've heard, it, yeah. I, I've heard this about London and followed along with like London being paralyzed by a little bit of snow. No, I mean, New York is better at it. Uh, what I will say, I've lived in New York the last 18 or 19 years now and grew up in the Northeast also. But um the last few, I mean, there's been decreasing amounts of snow every year. And last winter, there was no snow that stuck on the ground, actually. So things are warming, things are changing. Um, I can't say as a New Yorker that I, like, I miss the the momentary beauty of the snow, but, you know, it's, it's a pain in the ass, honestly, like to get around, you know, once it's been sitting there for a minute. So kind of happy to be, to not be trudging through slush, honestly. So I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to attempt to find a through line through all of this yeah. uh, to get us right in. So check it out. So the <laughs> snow initially very magical, right? Super magical. When you look at it, new technology appears like magic. I think Arthur C. Clarke mentioned that as, as one of his quotes, like new tech is, is magic. Right. Um, but also oh, indistinguishable about- from. Ooh, look at you. Like it. I like it. But you also think about like um, snow and cities and having the infrastructure to deal with the magic. Right. So, uh, you know, there's there's a there's a line between like new technologies and really pulling it down to like, hey, what can we do today with this existing infrastructure? So tell us what is near futurism, Neil, and, and how has your approach developed over the years to figure figure out how to get tactical with futurism? Sure. So you guys, you did a pretty good job, I think, in the intro, um, broad stroke outlining what it is. Uh, But I'll just say a little bit more in terms of my own personal journey. So I kind of grew up professionally writing software, doing software engineering and software project leadership in the first half of my career. And then about 12 years ago or so, I decided I didn't want to code all the time for production software and saw an opportunity to pivot through the agency and sort of services world doing creative technology, bringing this understanding of technology to bear on work for brands, work for businesses. I got the opportunity to run the first digital experience design team. We talked about digital experience um, at Gensler, this big architecture firm starting in 2015. And and so, and then done a bunch of work since then, but increasingly it's been about this convergence of digital and physical and what digital can be when it's more and more deeply connected with our bodies and our physical surroundings and objects in our surroundings. And that just is just the most interesting dimension of digital capability to me. On the way, like sort of on this path, I've started using, like retailers were used this term omni-channel to talk about, you know, digital and physical stores and various other ways to reach and connect with customers, which has issues that sort of rooted in this idea of distinct channels. And so I never liked that term. And the work that I do anyway is is broader than retail. So I started using this a bit unwieldy, but I think I still haven't really found a better of holistically digital physical ecosystems, right, for brands and for businesses. And the term ecosystem is important. And it ties back to what you're describing, Jeremy, about, um, about mycelium, because what you want, I think, for a brand, or if you're a brand, and if you're a customer of a brand, which basically um, includes everybody, you really want to, and this has been part of the conversation in the agency and brand world for a long time, you want to have a, a consistent, coherent kind of relationship or feel um, in the interactions and the touch points you have, regardless of whether they're in person or digital or on the web or on a mobile app or on a phone or through a chat bot. I mean, they want to all feel on brand and consistent. And so the concept of ecosystems and connecting these things uh, became, I found really valuable just as a, as a lens to describe the kind of work that was possible and that we want to do and that I was most um, 
I think, well-suited to do with brands and businesses that I've worked with. So bringing this back to near futurism, the because I have this bias towards emerging technology and I've always been interested, even going back to the 90s in VR and AR and more recently conversational UI and, and AI enabled um, interactions, people tend to call me a futurist. And around 2019, you know, I, I took the stance that you know, I see that futurists and futurism is a increasingly well-established practice, right? There's strategic foresight that is very driven by data, doing detailed ballistic analysis, prediction. That's all a very important and valuable set of practices that I use and leverage and many of us do. And it's not the core of what I do. What I am really focused on and strategic foresight, I think is generally although there are exceptions, it's generally further out, right? It's, it's not what can be reduced to practice today. But as a technologist and someone, as I've described, biased towards getting things built, I'm much more interested in what is emerging and what's on the edge of, you know, just barely mature enough to put into practice. And how can that be used to address current needs of brands and businesses? So these points of connection and really the discovery and invention of new ways or new modes of connectedness is relates the ecosystem language to the near future work that I do, you know, and it's, it's, I've increasingly been looking for ways to talk about this as creating um, brands and businesses that almost naturally evolve, naturally evolve like living systems do. And I think we're, we're getting there with AI. Like there's, there's, we're on the verge of having agents that can operate as kind of nodes in these brand and business ecosystems or business models that can evolve themselves in certain ways by how they interact with people and how they interact with objects and physical environments and all that. So there's a lot there and we could spend the rest of the time unpacking that. But again, just to, to bring it back, near futurism is really about connecting what's, what's emerging as possible today with what's practical for brands and businesses in the immediate. Some of the things just, um, go ahead, Mark. I was just gonna say thank you for somebody, maybe removing the word omni-channel because it, I find it such a, a tiring word because whenever I hear that I have to do something omni-channel, I'm like, oh, well that's gonna take forever then because there's about 3,500 different channels and do I have to do something on all of them can't if it's an ecosystem that feels instantly lighter it feels instantly more more viable to complete my tasks it, it might be it might be slightly delusional in certain cases right i mean i will say that as i have a particular passion for for retail i often wonder like what am i what am i doing working in retail because it's such a slow moving industry and it's very easy for me and for many technology enthusiasts to see opportunities to improve the way people connect with the things they want and need right it's a very fundamental human thing that we do it's like we we need and want things and retail broadly like helps us fulfill on them but as a business retail it just tends to move very very slowly and it's a hard industry to sell on evolving how they operate um and and the term omnichannel points to that, right? That it's it immediately connotes this like legacy set of sort of heavy inertia laden kind of <laughs> modes that are that are operated by you know business unit leaders that will defend them at all costs, right? And so it's hard to create this sort of integrated ecosystem. Well, it's 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 the it's like the multiverse marketing strategy. It's like everything everywhere all at once, right? Where it's like, holy moly, like how do we, how do we pull that off? Well, I, I wanted to highlight a couple of quick things. Um, number one, a lot of what we're talking about today, uh, reminder to our disruptors and curious minds that we actually have a book club and we are unpacking some of these theories right now that we're talking about. And Neil, one thing that resonated with what you said with the book we're reading, The Nexus um, by Julio Latino, is, is this idea of thinker and doer almost in the same spot because you 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 said the um i think what you said was like the a propensity for wanting to build things right and not just think about them so what's the key to balancing the thinker and doer that's in your brain and how do you coach that out of other people 
coach the th- oh coach the that balance out of other people yes um you know i think coming from from software and coming from software development and software product development i just have this strong bias towards coming up with hypotheses that can then be quick sometimes you prototype uh I mean, there are many different kinds of prototypes. Sometimes the prototype to test a hypothesis uh, takes the form of a piece of software that gets in the hands of uh, a target audience or a suspected user of the software. And so then it can, then we can quickly validate ideas about it. This is often just called minimum viable product or a minimum viable test. Um, but I think this is the really the connection point. I mean, there's a lot of people who do various kinds of futurist or, or future leaning strategy work that don't bring the capability of quickly coming to testable hypotheses. And I think this is changing because, you know, the past 12 months of large language models and everything that's possible there is making it um, in many ways easier to test ideas. We used to, you know, have this concept of um, paper prototype right? Like if you work with user experience designers, as I often do, and I've played that role at times as well, you come up with an idea, maybe it's an interface for a mobile app or, or a web app or something, and you just mock it up and you can draw it out on paper as a sequence of states of a, of a UI, or you could prototype it using any number of different tools. Figma is one of the more popular recent ones. And then just put it in front of people and see like, does this make sense? Like, let's role play, you know, let's get a sense of what this context or what this job to be done is that you have. And let's, let's walk through that. So I think I'm answering your question, Jeremy. It's, 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 um, I think really it's important to observe. I mean, this is my strong opinion that ideas can only, um, they can't really be well tested until you put them into some kind of practice, right? And if it's an idea about how a human would interact with a piece of software, you've got to test that. If it's an idea about how a business could potentially be more efficient by deploying a certain mobile app or a certain kind of planning strategy or whatever, like you can, you can test these things now. And so I think the job of near futurist or important part of it is not just connecting possibility with practical need, but also translating that into a testable hypothesis hypothesis that can then be you know quickly proven or disproven and then you can iterate from there so most of that language is is very familiar to people who have built software it's you know the sort of fail fast iterative agile i mean it's in the spirit of all of those traditional software um, methodologies or sets of best practices and you know i'm really trying to bring that in distinctive way in my this businesses that's that really want to test out like they have often they have an idea like oh i think i can do this with open ai's api or i think i can do this with um you know some other kind of ai video generation thing in the world of brands and marketing which i know you guys um cover a lot there's so much opportunity for ai for content generation right i mean this is probably the biggest point of connection right in 2023 so far between ai and brands and marketing is is just the amazing kinds of content you can generate and the the risks right because it's easy to create content that maybe is off brand or inaccurate or inconsistent or even you know um sort of violates cultural norms you might say but um yeah, yeah the, so the- as well no, it's amazing. The thinking and doing thing obviously is resonating with a lot of people. You know, Nolan Ether, who's been a longtime friend of the show and a great creative uh, emerging tech mind. You know, a lot of content on LinkedIn and stuff chiming in on this as well. I want to, I want to, I want to pick at this one a little bit more and try and tie it into another theme that we talk about a ton on this show. Is is the oscillation between uh, emergent and hierarchical uh, mechanics when something is built and how. How would you relate that little uh, th- those two things, uh, emergent nature and hierarchical nature, with thinking and doing? Do they play a part? As you mentioned, some of these naturally evolving systems and the need to scale eventually. 
So by hierarchical, you mean sort of top-down determined, right? Like we declare yes. we're going to build this thing um, sort of separate from what naturally emerges from the system. Um, you know, I mean, I think that's just the, the default way things operate if you're a corporation or an organization building something, right? Um, I do think, you know, and this is probably clear from earlier parts of uh, this conversation, that we are on the verge of, well, we're already like deep into this era of co-creating with AI, right? I mean, that's that's clear this year. And, and I think the vast majority of folks, including people listening to this, have spent at least some amount of time with ChatGPT and other machine learning models, you know, for visual content creation to have a sense of they're really, really good thought partners and exp partners in exploration of an idea, whether it's visual or language based or whatever. And the step from that mode of, of co-creation to, as we were describing earlier, to the automatic or autonomous, or I guess maybe self-initiated um, imp iterative improvement of aspects of a system may not be that huge of a step. You know, I think Sam Altman in his um, Dev Day keynote talked about, um, you know, the path to agents, which is just short shorthand the term agent right in the AI world for autonomous entities that can just be given a, a directive and then go figure out how to fulfill it and then actually fulfill it, um, including things that involve what we would just call real world or physical world interaction, right? And connecting these models with robots and ability to make phone calls and and just the web generally. I mean, all this stuff has been rapidly um, coming online this year. But I think that, I mean, obviously there are loads of dangers and risks, but I think the ability to create as nature does these self-healing um, equilibrium seeking, symbiosis seeking um, systems of humans and AI. I mean, this is, I think, the, I'll call it the near future. I mean, it, it, it's a mindset, I think, or a lens through which um, the kind of technology grounded systems that we're building ought to be uh, seen. You know? And it, it is a lofty idea, but I think it's, it's just clearly what's coming if you look at the technology, right? So if you were, uh... I don't know how you choose who you work with, but if you're advising brands listening to this who don't really have any systems in place at the moment for AI or AR or spatial computer, anything in terms of a near future department. So you, if you were, if you had like two hours to give somebody some consulting on that, that's where you'd start. Um, where I would start would be. So the, the, the core or the essential kind of near futurist workshop that I've been building over the time that I've run innovation teams at Mediacom and then Gensler and then ThoughtWorks and then in my own venture, Reading Futures, um, essentially has just three components, right? The first one is spend some time understanding the brand, understanding the business model. You know, if you've got half an hour, you can understand it very high level. If you've got a week, which I've had in certain workshops, you can understand a much deeper level and do interviews with subject matter experts inside a company. You know, I've done this with a large um, rail car leasing company, also with an international shipping and logistics company. And so in those contexts, the business models are complex and you want to take some time to interview people. But so it can be sized variably, but the first piece is understand the brand, understand the business model. The second piece is um, with that knowledge, look at what's emerging in terms of new tech, new, new capabilities and start to connect dots, right? And, and bring people along on the client side to understand in, in kind of layman's terms what these capabilities are. And ideally express them in terms of like the jobs to be done that they understand in their business model, right? Use their language, which is why the first piece is get a, a briefing in the business model and the brand, right? So there's the understand the business model. There's understand what's emerging as possible. And then the third piece, as we talked about a little bit earlier, is connect the dots so that you can say, you know, if we 
for example, and this is a real example going back to ThoughtWorks days, you know, if we trained our airplane mechanics in virtual reality instead of flying them around and putting them in rooms with paper workbooks to learn like how to work on airplane engines and do maintenance and repair. If we, if we used an immersive VR simulation, there would be much better learning retention. Um, we would save a lot of money because people could do this from wherever you could have a trainer, one place and trainees, other places, it's internet connected. You have this immersive simulation where training is happening and we would save X dollars and Y amount of time per year and whatever. Right. So, there are these hypotheses and that's a fairly complex hypothesis, but you know, they could just be short, but coming out of a workshop again, if it's longer, you can have more in depth hypotheses, but these are the things that can then be tested. And so after this, uh, this workshop, they're designed so that there is, so that clients will emerge with an, an understanding of what we think are the most important areas to pay attention to in terms of technology that's becoming relevant or capabilities are becoming relevant to their business model and then give them a menu of actions that they can take and correlate those ideally with with business impacts so that they can go back and then decide which of these do we want to actually execute because each one could be translated into a into a project scope right so does that make sense i mean it's it's pretty straightforward it's not yeah, like yep. it's not like I'm the only person approaching it this way, of course, but it's, it's, uh, my sense is that I'll add one other thing, and this is related to, to near futurism. I started using this term near futurist to distinguish between futurism, as I talked about earlier, back in 2019, and people would be like, ah, oh, it would nod sort of gently. Like I see uh, that's, that's cool. That's clever. This year in October, after I came off this nine month, very focused um, commercialization effort with a spatial computing tech startup in Hong Kong that I can talk about too, was really focused on that for the whole year. And then October I came back and was like, okay, I'm gonna s return to this near futurist idea as a consulting offering. Like, let's see, let's see what I can build here. I started telling people I'm a near futurist and from like private equity fund managers to leaders of consultancies to people in the brand world, they were like, that's good. There's something there that's really distinctive. And I had never gotten this kind of enthusiastic feedback for this concept before. And I was like, why, why is this? And I think there, there are two main reasons. One is in the intervening years, just COVID, right? It's definitely proven to people that massive disruption can come out of nowhere. And, and so we, we've learned that things can change really fast, but then AI is, is similar to that in this over the past 12 months, right? Is that anybody, I'm not even gonna say anybody's paying attention. There's no one who fails to realize just how rapidly things are changing now. And so there's this general sense of people are overwhelmed. If, if they're not in the weeds with the tech, they just don't know what to pay attention to. And so they need help. And people keep saying like, Neil, like people need help. And, and you guys were speaking to that earlier as well. Like there's just this sense of, the need for guidance and and focusing, right? Well, so. it's the, it's also two it's things. It's it's the type of change and the rate of change is the is the exponential equation where people they're blowing people's minds. Um, I think I, one thing I want to touch on in your in your near futurist consulting methodology, uh, you know. So this is me. I spent a lot of time in the data center space. Um, you know, these large facilities, network compute, storage, disaster recovery, capacity planning, like. I lived in that world for like 15, I still kind of do for like 15 or 16 years. And I always see um, innovation departments in these large bureaucratic organizations having great ideas, but when they, when it comes down to it, they haven't prepared themselves on the infrastructure side to execute even small pilots. So how much of your consulting practice involves kind of, well, Hey, what's the current state infrastructure wise in your team and what is the feasibility of pulling off some of these really cool pilots? How do you balance that? Yeah, it's, it's an important question and it's something that I've encountered, you know, um, all along the way, right. When I described, uh, I mean, it's one thing to do software engineering either for products or, um, to a set of requirements for a client. I mean, that's much more, it just, the context created for that tends to be much better for the incorporation of the end result into the business, right? Um, 
but you're exactly right. I mean, every time, ever since I've been doing this kind of creative tech for brands or innovation work or digital experience in physical space or emerging tech at ThoughtWorks, like there's, there's always this passion. I mean, the teams I'm leading, you know, including myself, I mean, maybe I sort of set the tone because I'm just really enthusiastic about what's, what's newly possible. And it's so easy really to come up with ideas and prototype them out and demonstrate them and even impress people that are prospective buyers of this that, I mean, they say, yeah, I can see how that would be valuable. And we've got 12 to 18 months of just keep the lights on kind of projects in our pipeline. We can't defer any of those. So we can't take action on what you're presenting. Um, but more maybe precisely to your point, Jeremy, there's, there's uh, even when things do get built, if they get built separately as prototypes or, or worst case, like a full fledged system, they often just uh, fall down at the point of uh, attempting to integrate them into the rest of the operational infrastructure for the business. So, I mean, there have been many models tried over the years. There's kind of the in-house incubated innovation team, there's external, you know, spin up an innovation team or innovation hub, and we'll sponsor it and create these, you know, great um, pieces that have marketing value, have brand value, um, demonstrate that a brand is a, is a leader or an innovator, um, but still can't be integrated well. And then there's the, the, I think the more useful stance of recent years, which is everyone needs to think innovatively, right? I mean, it's maybe less tractable or less actionable, but it's a, I think it's the right idea. Um, I think the best approach, honestly, is to have someone, and I've actually recently been talking to uh, leading consultancies about this kind of role, um, and actually interviewed for one just before the pandemic, actually at a big consultancy, but having there be a role for someone with my kind of expertise to uh, have visibility into the projects that a company is doing and and bring the kind of insight that I'm describing these workshops um, produce to to the projects that are in the pipeline, right? And then just looking for opportunities with program, product, project managers to incrementally introduce these new capabilities into existing projects that are already planned out, you know? And I think that's a, you know, a couple of years ago, that would have seemed way less possible than it is now. But I think the the AI tools, the the language models, and the various other kinds of machine learning models that are so increasingly good at taking data with very little um, pre work, you know, very little preparation, and making really great use of it. I think there's there's just so much opportunity to to introduce these things into existing systems that. Um, I'm really optimistic. I think I think the game is changing rapidly in terms of the ability to to do what we're talking about. I like that. And I think that you described it as the keeping the lights on work and integrating this into that keeping the lights on work. And I think it, uh, the smaller you go in the, in the company size, the more perhaps important that is. And um, just going back to what you said about near futurism, I'm expecting to see... Oh, a, a horde of near futurists appear on LinkedIn if the VCs are saying that it's a great a great idea that you have. So I'll look out for that. Um, I think we can all agree that whatever happens, AI is going to play a role in any type of new technology that companies use. I think we that we just agree that's going to happen. So I want to go to spatial computing. You said you'd been in Hong Kong for the last nine months working on this um let's talk about spatial computing for people who don't know what it is could you just give us a a very broad overview of what it's going to do and how it's going to change things and then perhaps tell us a little bit about what you've actually been doing in hong kong as much as you can yeah sure thing so when people ask me you know what are the big uh sort of tech trends or areas that we should be focusing on for 2024 i mean goes without saying that AI broadly uh, is the number one. And of course, there's so much happening within AI that there's um, that it's important to be able to 
pay attention or sort of figure out what, what areas to focus on. Right. And we talked about that a little bit earlier Um, and look, you know, coming at it, not from, not from just what's possible or what's happening, but starting from what does our business need to do? Like, and then looking at AI as a tool to help accelerate that, make it more efficient, um, help, you know, be assistance to, to people in their interaction with customers and so on. Um, so AI, right. But spatial computing is actually a much less discussed, but I think equally important, uh, trend for 2024 and beyond. Um, one of the reasons for this is that Apple, uh, I mean, the reason why I've been leaning into the term more, even though I've been using it for years, is that Apple uh, in its June announcement of the Vision Pro headset, its first purpose-built spatial computer, as Tim um, discussed, Apple's using this term, right? And we knew they weren't going to call any sort of purpose-built AR or mixed reality device, a metaverse device, that was clear. But they use the term augmented reality a lot, which is a very similar, um, it's a re- closely related term to spatial computing, but I'll define uh, spatial computing essentially as giving software-enabled devices the ability to understand very precisely where they are relative to other objects and aspects of their physical environment, right? And part of this is kind of where they are in the world, which is how you might describe GPS. But spatial computing is actually less interested specifically in where a device is in broadly in the world, but it's more about what is its local context and what does it need to know in order to interact effectively with its physical um, environment, the objects in the environment. So if you pay close attention to what Apple announced, you might ask, what does that have to do with the Apple Vision Pro, right? It's a headset that mostly you see in the keynote anyway, people sitting back on their couch watching video that looks like it's on a 100 foot wide screen. Um, It's a great way to consume content. It's a great way to do FaceTime and document collaboration and things like this. I mean, that's that was that was demonstrated. But there wasn't a whole lot of what I'm describing, which is this device really taking advantage of a of a nuanced and a precise understanding of where it is in physical space. I think that's coming. I mean, phones already, especially high end phones with high end cameras and especially those with LIDAR are arguably, I would, I would say, spatial computers in the sense that they're good at, um, they can be made to be very good at knowing precisely where they are and, and tracking their movement in space. Um, one other thing I'll just remind people of is that Tim Cook's stance, just to level set around the importance of spatial computing, was that spatial computing is the third major era of computing. And of course, Apple took credit for introducing all three of them Macintosh introduced (laughs) personal computing, right? Going back to the 80s. iPhone introduced mobile computing. And now Vision Pro is introducing us to spatial computing. These are almost exactly Tim Cook's words. So from Apple's perspective, spatial computing deserves to be placed alongside mobile and personal. And we know how radically society changing each of those other eras has been right it's you can't really overstate the impact that each of these eras of computing has had on society so so spatial computing is going to be big it's it's that headset is just a first gambit bringing it back now to um like what have i been doing what has so the company i i consulted with this year is called alki labs auki and I met them about a year ago, and they've been developing for a couple of years at that point a decentralized collaborative spatial computing protocol. It's like five words. It's kind of a mouthful. Wow. Um, each of those words is important. Um, the one thing I'll particularly point to is that if, you, if you're familiar with spatial computing or augmented reality, you might know that the status quo way for a device to understand where it is in its environment sufficiently well to be able to place, uh, sort of correctly place the right digital objects and content uh, in that coordinate system and then present it to the user in augmented reality, you know, on on a phone. 
uh, is digital twins or visual positioning, right? So if, if you look at Niantic, if you look at Google, if you look at any other major tech companies, they do visual positioning, which basically means uh, thanks to prior visual scans of an environment, when I enter the, enter the space that's been previously scanned and scan it visually and upload that scan to the cloud and the machine learning model in the cloud, it will get compared. And if it matches the prior scan, then this device can know, ah, like I know what this space is and what should go where in terms of digital mm -hmm. objects. And then I can see them in augmented reality. And that can happen fairly quickly, but it's very com computationally intensive. It's also quite bandwidth intensive. And so, and it's also importantly from, especially from Alki Lab's perspective, um, a privacy invasion, right? Because it means that your phone's camera can see whatever is visible um, to the camera in your physical environment. So if it's your home, maybe you don't want Niantic or Google or whoever to see what's happening in your home. And so Alki's stance is that's not a future we want. And so the company invented a couple of years ago this really clever and exciting way of placing QR codes that are, you know, 10 to 20 centimeters um, on the floor. Ideally, they can be on walls as, as well, <clears throat> uh, periodically throughout a space. And then these are used as anchor points so that the proprietary software the company has built can scan those. And then once scanned, the user is then in this 3D coordinate system. And then from there, it achieves, the system achieves the same things I was just describing. Like it knows where to place digital objects and content. And so that's kind of a description of spatial computing, the general capabilities, kind of the, the why at the level of the technology or the platform. And I can stop here or we could talk a little bit about like, so what, right? Because well, no, that who's was making use of it, right? Like what's the, what's the business value? What's the consumer user value? I mean, because I haven't touched on that really yet. I saw today it was, I don't know if it was real or not, but essentially Google scanning the London Underground for for exactly what, what you say. So it's 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 happening. What, yeah, one it's thing, happening. Yeah. Oh, just real quick, Neil, I, want, I wanted to kind of like, because that's a really interesting way you've, you've laid that out. Now, once this, once this coordinate system is built for a particular environment, say it's a brand environment that, you know, you want to extend the physical experience into the digital experience, right? Do you see now brands looking at looking at that asset, that coordinate list, that that uh, <clears throat> visual representation digitally, right, um, as a way to create new user journeys in that experience? And those user journeys could be powered eventually by game engines that are like, if this, then that, right? If I walk over here and I step on step into this particular space, something's going to happen behind me that's going to drive me to walk over. Is that where we're getting? Is Just that where things are headed? Don't don't click don't click. Except on any website, Jeremy. Otherwise, <laughs> that's it. Ten four. Yes. So, I think if I'm hearing your description correctly, Jeremy, it's um, very similar to what Niantic has done for a number of years, right? There's this game they created called Ingress. You know this game? This was a number of years. This was before Pokemon Go, actually, and yep. it's still a thing. Um, but it is a it is a multiplayer game that gets people out in the world at the time it was a little bit like leveraging the the um how would i say this like the enthusiasm for geocaching right and sort of like a little bit of real world physical world treasure hunting but um but it's a it's a massively multiplayer game that tracks where you are in space and uses that spatial location that spatial context as part of the gameplay it's information that's relevant to to the game and i say it that way um as a bit of a segue just to describe really briefly what um where we've commercialized with this alki labs technology this year um is kind of driven by the principle that physical context for information is very important and very powerful um, and that digital tools that aren't leveraging spatial computing and, and augmented reality um, are missing out on this, right? So if you think about, so we, I have a retail background as we've talked about a little bit and um, at least the intersection of retail and emerging tech. And so last December, 
the leadership of the company said, Hey, you know, you've got background in retail. You obviously have passion around spatial computing. Do you want to come on and like help us commercialize this technology for retail? So first part of the year, you know, we focused on the value that we were getting a lot of traction um, with retailers around promotions. Like we had to start with like, what's actually going to move the needle in terms of retail business, right? We talked earlier about how slow moving they are. Um, so what's going to get them excited? One thing to get that gets them excited is driving larger basket size, right? For grocery or big box or whatever. And so, you know, similar to the idea with, you know, training airplane mechanics, you know, it's you just this, it's this train of thought of, okay, driving bigger basket size, what would do that? Well, maybe, you know, there are products in the store that shoppers aren't aware of that if they were aware of them, they would add them to their basket, right? Often those are promoted items. Promoted items are ones that the store wants to drive consumption of basket, uh, basket ads. Um, so there was a lot of enthusiasm from grocery retail, especially around if we can place digital augmented reality promotions uh, in this coordinate system in the store, then shoppers will discover them. We can build this into our native mobile app as a retailer and they may see a lot more promotions than they would if they just moved around the store right and in pilots that's that's proving out i mean i think that's that's still a hypothesis that's that's ongoing it's sort of a long testing cycle honestly to prove that out um but then the other piece i'll just describe really briefly is kind of much more tractable we kind of realized mid-year or late spring that on the retail operations side, store associates, um, there's a lot of communication about, you know, hey, Mark, you know, you just started as a as a new staff, you know, at this, at this Walmart, I'm going to make this up, I'm not wishing this on you. Um, but, uh, you know, we need this stuff restocked, you know, where it goes, go find out where it goes. And like, training and onboarding to so that new staff has this mental model of what goes where is a heavy lift and there's such high turnover in, in these businesses that a huge amount of time and money is spent on training. And a lot of that training is about what goes where, what's the physical context for things that happen in the store. And if you can remove that and, and the software we're building with these mobile apps that leverage this core system helps dramatically reduce the need for training because you can just take a barcode of a product that needs to be restocked somewhere and be guided in augmented reality directly to the shelves where those products go. Or conversely, you can scan a barcode if you're order picking for an e-commerce order and then just be guided to where they where those products are and then very quickly add them to the order and then you know pick and pack and ship for e-commerce. So pilots are demonstrating that you can dramatically reduce the time and also the the error rate, right, of any kind of information that has a physical context related to it. Um, there's a certain error rate Definitely. because people, you know, if you used to say, put the Oatly on aisle five on the far end, like people have a hard time often like having a mental model of what that means or where that goes, right? It's hard to communicate about physical context actually. Um, but spatial computing is is very good at this. So that's kind of the broader, you know, if you think about 2024 spatial computing, where can brands and businesses actually start to make use of it? I would say it's simply like, let's think about where are the aspects of your business and operational model that rely heavily on physical context for information. And let's see if we can introduce these, these kind of capabilities that, you know, reduce errors and increase efficiency around those. Does that make sense? It, it's fascinating. And it, it's kind of a, I hadn't really thought of that moving around space and how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours you could save, especially in like when the turnover is so high in, in such a simple thing as knowing the layout of the shop. It adds up very quickly. I mean, especially if you're a big chain, right? I mean, even yeah. if you shave off a few seconds on average for, for one of those things, it adds up to seven, eight figures of, of money, you know, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the one thing that, that stood out to me, well, actually, there's a lot of things that stood out to me in that whole uh, that whole answer, Neil, was amazing. Thank you. The Is the physical context for digital information and digital tools, right? 
And, you know, this this might be eking into further futurism than near futurism, because I like how you applied it to, hey, here's what we're doing today. But I've always thought there's an emotional context to this, too. Uh, I've got a bit of a music background as well, and I've been thinking about ways that uh, of extending these digital experiences from the physical route, right? Nothing replaces the physical experience of being in a live venue together, right? The three of us, a bunch of us, right? And there's like this liminal process when we turn from individuals into audience, right? But a lot of the, I mean, some digital music experiences work, but others like lack a little bit of that in that magic. So like what, so this, this might be a can of worms that we're opening up, but like, how do you, how do you, don't, don't open it. Yeah. Yeah. Just balancing the magic. Anyway, that's where I'm thinking. That's where my head goes. I know we got to be mindful of time, Mark. Uh, rein me in, sir. Yeah. Don't open that can of worms. We laughed. We'll it, do it next Save time. that kind of, yep. yeah. Save that kind of worms for, for the next time. Then we can get Neil on again, because as you said, Jeremy, there is so much to think about and so much to unpack just from that one answer on that. So um, I'm going to refrain. Awesome. I think you're going to like stir the pot very slightly because I think what you're pointing to, if I heard you correctly, is these these metaverse ideas that just don't turn out to be compelling, right? Because there's not enough of a sense of presence. Right? Presence is this magical thing that, that enables serendipity and other magical aspect of human experience, right? And um, digital, so far, digital platforms haven't really i mean like this is great like we we feel to a to a very non-zero degree right a substantial degree present together but it's still nothing like you know if we were hanging out in person right so anyway that's so i'll leave it at there i mean maybe we come back to that i think i've had uh entire conversations including like panels on stage at immersive conferences talking about presence and how how to facilitate presence over distance and time and i think that's a, a very human thing that i i have some passion about i haven't really been investing a whole bunch of time in but it's something that is is sort of a informed a bunch of the exploratory work that i've done over the years with immersive tech so Awesome. Awesome. Well, this this has yeah. been a fascinating conversation. I think we've got a lot of comments in the thread too, a bunch that, you know, Neil, if you have some time over the next day or so to jump into the comment threads, I think on YouTube and, and LinkedIn where this is all posted, there's some really good conversations coming out of there. Um, want to thank you very much for, for bringing this near futurist idea uh, to bear. I think it resonates in a lot of ways, like, a, you know, like we said in the title, a practical approach. Uh, to futurism, right? And how do we do stuff today? How do we pilot? How do we KPI it? How do we do all that stuff? So thank you so much uh, for joining us. Mark will do a great write up. Uh, feel free to send us any links and we can we can push them out to our audience. But a um, couple of shout outs uh, to the tail end here. Um, again, thanks to Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E.com, Marketing's On Demand Talent Platform. You got a project towards the end of the year and we are getting dangerously close to the end of the year flex out to some great qualified um uh solopreneurs in that world those guys are great and uh mark tell these people about our book club that is growing over leaps and bounds over the last little bit tell them how to get on there uh nolan asked about it in the in the thread um tell them about it what are we doing you go to www.thinkingonpaper.xyz and there'll be a, a really well-designed pop-up by me that will come up and you put your email address in there and you join the book club and on the book club we are going to choose the second book in the next week or so that people can get over christmas and then we start again in the new year we can all do it together do you mind if i just add a ps to the show and one of the things that uh, we speak about this a lot Jeremy, input output and ai is all about our input output and i always wonder with our guests about their input and if neil if i could just ask you the last week what does your input look like books movies music specifically like what yeah what what was the last movie you saw what was the last book you read and what do you, what books do you read in general and what movies do you watch in general or not at all perhaps well it's a little bit eclectic um not a big consumer of books this is this will be entertaining to people i actually um I hesitate to out myself this way. I'm an outlier. I had never read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy until this week. So I That's I'm okay. Reading that and uh I think what happened was like I I was listening to uh, actually a quite compelling 
um, interview with obviously a very controversial figure, Elon Musk, who was referencing it again. I'm like, okay, I, you know, in the way he referenced it, I was like, I need to go. This is a cultural gap. Um, in terms of movies and TV, I don't, this is, too, it seems unrelated. Like I've really been enjoying watching the Gilded Age on HBO actually. Like it's a, uh, a time period in the history of New York City where I live, which I which I quite love, and it's interesting because a, a really core element of the of the intersecting plot lines is um, the aggressive capitalism of railroad tycoons and and other you know like the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and the Vanderbilts and they aren't all named as such in the in the show but it's it's just very interesting to to see the development of all that like in it's a much more raw state than it is right now um yeah no one's mentioning Elon and Lex exactly so so those are two things um i actually what's queued up to read is uh, also quite a an old book, but it's been mentioned enough times recently that I realized I need to read it. Is Ian Banks' Consider Phlebas? I think the the first in this so called culture series, and I've had a few people reference it this past week. And this is kind of as someone who's not a huge reader, certainly of fiction as well. Um, this is how things get into my queue. Is I just you know if I have two or more people reference it that I really respect, I'm like okay. Now it's got to get queued up. So I don't know if people have read that, but um, I'm excited to, to read that next. I think they're mentioning that because of my a post that I put on LinkedIn last week about Consider Flobis and Ian M. Banks and the culture books. Because again, um, Elon referen referenced it in um, a talk that he did, but on AI, I think it was with the British Prime Minister, but Consider Flebis is brilliant. I think I, I didn't read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy until later as well. I think that I don't maybe it's an age thing where we were probably reading like Arthur C. Clarke and there was some people were reading Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and some people were reading It's just uh, Do you I know, I think interest. that I'm I think it's like it's not quite having never seen Monty Python, but it's almost there for like <laughs> for kind of my peer group of like people, you know, computer science nerd philosophy oriented kids of gen x you know i mean i think it's it's core yeah and we we can't all be on top of everything and uh, appreciate your exercise and vulnerability and sharing what's on what's on deck i think it's awesome um yeah one one i'm going to answer your question mark and i know we're out of time but i'm going to answer your question really quickly even though you didn't ask me do uh, i ask you a question which question if, even if you did ask me so uh, if you guys are readers and you struggle with kind of focusing and harnessing your focus. I do. I have to listen to a certain type of music when I'm reading or when I'm writing just to kind of lock me in. But um, New Blue Sun uh, by Andre 3000. Uh, yes, the half of Outcast. It's been on loop whenever I need to get in creative zen and flow moments. Uh, check it out. If you're looking for AT aliens, this is not going to be your jam. But uh, it is brilliant and wonderful and helps my create creative process. Mark, right. take us away, my friend. Okay thank you stay curious and we'll see you next week with our last guest of season one um we've got a, we're going a little bit artistic next week Jeremy. we're going to be exploring digital art um amongst other things but yeah our last show of the season and can't wait for it thinking on paper xyz join the book club see you soon thanks for being here neil thank you guys it's been a pleasure thank you. bye bye